and physiology of blood vessels, which I know will be a review for most of you. And then I will go on to talk about the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis. Okay, so let's talk about the blood vessels. Now, the blood vessels have three layers. On the inside, we have the tunica intima. And the tunica intima is made up of a single layer of endothelial cells. So if you can imagine that's sort of the inside of the tube. And then there's a thin layer of basement membrane below it. So that's the tunica intima. Now the tunica intima um, being a layer of endothelial cells is present in arteries and veins and capillaries and actually pretty much contiguous throughout the circul circulatory system. It is also um, essentially the same layer that is in, that makes up the endocardium. Okay, and then beyond that we have a, a layer of elastic tissue and smooth muscle. And this layer varies in thickness depending on what type of vessel it is. I'm just going to draw sort of a line around that. And this one is called the tunica media. Now the tunica media is the one that changes the most from vessel to vessel. So with um, vessels that what are called the elastic arteries. They have a very thick uh, tunica media and the tunica media is primarily made up of elastin, hence the name. So what we have with elastic arteries is, here let me draw another picture here. So we have a, you know, our regular old tunica intima and then we have layers and layers of, of elastin so it's very, very thick. And then interspersed within that are small, little, smooth muscles. So, you know, these smooth muscles are not really big enough to significantly constrict um, and dilate the vessel. It can a little bit, but primarily um, the strength layer of the strength of the tunica media and elastic arteries comes from the elastin tissue. Now um, we also have muscular arteries and muscular arteries are going to be sort of the mid-sized arteries and the muscular arteries are going to have you know still a fairly thick tunica media won't be quite as thick as the tunica intima I mean is the tunica media of elastic arteries and there's going to be some elastic tissue but it's primarily going to be made up of lots and lots of smooth muscle fibers. So these are going to be very amenable to dilation and constriction. And then moving down to arterioles, arterioles have, you know, a um, thinner layer of uh, muscle because it doesn't, the muscles don't need to be as thick when you get down to the arterioles because the blood pressure has dropped significantly by that time, but they're the uh, arteries that can constrict the most. And then we have veins. And veins have a, the same tunica intima with the endothelial cells on the inside and then it has a very thin layer 
that has some elastin. And some smooth muscle fibers. Now, veins, you know, I talked in an earlier video about how veins can um, oftentimes will constrict significantly to increase the um, return of blood to the heart. So, you know, if we have a big, like some of the veins in the body, primarily, you know, we have the biggest vein in the body, which is the inferior vena cava. It has muscle layers around it, and it can dilate significantly, or it can constrict significantly, um, and this allows it to sort of act as a blood reservoir. And the reason it's able to do this with a very thin tunica media is because um, the, blood, the blood pressure in the veins are very low, so, you know, from sort of 0 to 10 millimeters of mercury, whereas the blood pressure in the arteries, you know, are like 80 to 120 millimeters of mercury. So just because it has a thinner tunica media does not mean that it can't dilate and constrict. Um, it's just that it's dilating and constricting with much, much lower pressures, so it's able to do so with a much thinner wall. Now the tunica media is really the layer that dictates the thickness of the vessel wall. Because again, you know, the tunica intima is the same in all three vessels. And the outer layer is called the tunica adventitia. And this is connective tissue, primarily collagen, and it just adds a strength layer. Now, again, the tunica adventitia is going to be present in arteries and veins, and it's essentially the same from vessel to vessel. Now, the one thing else that I want to point out with vessel walls is very large vessels, like the aorta and the carotid, um, have such thick walls. Now, you know, a small vessel you know, let me start with this. A small vessel, you know, if you if it's only a few layers of cells thick, you know, if you just have a few layers of smooth muscle cells surrounding it, and imagine those are layers of cells. So this is very thin, and then you have your layer of collagen the tunica adventitia on the outside. The fluid, the plasma from inside inside the vessel is able to leak out through the capillaries and supply nutrients to all these cells. But if you, when you get up to vessels that are bigger than just a few layers, that have a tunica media that's a, thicker than a few layers of cells, then you're going to have to supply those cells with uh, nutrients from another source. So when you have very large arteries and, and very large veins with thicker walls, then you need to have vessels that supply the walls of those arteries. So we end up with, in the midst of these, little tiny arteries and veins called the vasophosorum. So these are called vasophosorum, and that is the network of blood vessels that supply uh, large arteries and veins. Okay. All right. So that's the basic anatomy of arteries veins and capillaries. Now remember the capillary is essentially just going to be a tunica intima with a basement membrane. There is no tunica media or tunica adventitia for capillaries. Okay, so that kind of covers the anatomy for all three vessel types. Atherosclerosis. So let's talk about the pathophysiology, what's going on here. So here I have a um, vessel wall and this is a uh, muscular 
artery. It's got a lot of smooth muscle in the tunica media. And we have out here the tunica adventitia. And here on the inside, we have the tunica intima and with um, sort of an exaggerated drawing of um, the endothelial cells in the tunica intima. Now, what's interesting here is this whole process starts out and this primarily involves the tunica intima, particularly in the beginning. And what happens is we have damage to the tunica intima. So the first thing that happens is damage to the tunica intima. So what can damage tunica intima? What can dam damage it? Well, one thing is smoking. And, you know, another thing is um, diabetes, um, hypertension, so high blood pressure. So what happens is we end up with injury to one of these endothelial cells. And maybe sort of the, we've got some shearing forces from high blood pressure. And actually one of the cells could actually completely die or maybe, you know, it's sort of pulled away from the... Um, endothelial wall. So we've got this little space here. Now, when an endothelial cell is damaged, it releases um, a chemical called von Willebrand factor. And we're going to talk about von Willebrand factor significantly in um, in our next week's um, session when we're talking about the uh, the hematologic system because it figures very prominently in um, in coagulation. So I'll just give give you a little introduction to it now. One of the ways that von Willebrand factor can be um, can be released is by endothelial cells when they are injured. And so what happens is we've got von Willebrand factor that's expressed by this endothelial cell, and these von Willebrand factors sort of acts like hooks. And what it hooks is platelets. So it connects and binds with platelets. So we end up with a platelet plug. Now one of the things that you're going to learn when we talk about the uh, coagulation process in depth is that there's close linkages between the coagulation cascade and the inflammatory cascade. So just the fact that we have platelet plug platelet activation and platelet plug formation because of von Willebrand factor, um, we are going to start inflammation. So what's inflammation do? Well, you know, it does causes vasodilation and increased blood flow and capillary leak, but it also calls, um, calls white blood cells to the area. And one of the white blood cells that comes trundling over to the area are macrophages. So we got macrophages coming to the area. Okay, now so that's one thing that we're starting the process of inflammation already. Now another thing that can happen is we've got little HDLs, and actually, actually it's LDLs that we're worried about. We have little LDLs floating around in the bloodstream, and the LDLs because there's an opening in the endothelial cells can um, can get in below the uh, basement membrane of the tunica intima and um, sort of lodge there, start to collect there. And HDLs are also uh, also cause inflammation. So we've got two things causing inflammation now, the platelet plug formation and um, the LDLs. Actually, I keep calling it HDLs, excuse me. It is the low density lip lipoproteins that we are concerned about. Okay. Okay, so this is sort of the first phase here where we have the uh, initial injury to endothelium and the beginning of inflammation.
and uh, the beginning of deposition of um, low density uh, lipoproteins in the uh, in the tunica intima or below the tunica intima. Now the second stage here is called fatty streak formation, and a fatty streak is due to continued LDL deposition below the tunica intima, intima. and we still have often have a platelet plug formation, and now we have. Um, lots and lots of macrophages that have sort of joined the party and they're engulfing one by one the particles of uh, LDL. And um, this generates um, the, the macrophages become so filled with LDLs that they are they become what are called foam cells. And foam cells are just these big distended macrophages that are filled with LDLs. Now, you know, these aren't typically all all that bad. I mean, they do add, continue to add to the inflammation, but they're not really, they're more of a sign of disease than they are the disease themselves. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, so the process can, this process will continue to, will continue as um, the inflammation gets worse, the, um, the LDLs continue to accumulate, and so you have this inflamed um, fatty streak here. Now, the end process of inflammation, we talked about this when we talked about the immune system, is the deposition of fibrin. So the third phase here is the development of a fibrous plaque. So a f what happens is all this inflammation causes the deposition of fibrin. So we end up with a fibrin cap trying to enclose this big inflamed area. Fibrous plaque. Okay, and oftentimes when the fibrous plaque is there, the bloodstream is sort of walled, the, this fatty streak is sort of walled off from the vessel, so you won't necessarily have it, it'll sort of become an indolent process. Now the inflammation is still going on very much underneath the surface, but it's not really interacting with the bloodstream anymore. So there's not necessarily any um, platelet aggregation or anything like that. However, this can continue to grow in size with more deposition of, of, um, of cholesterol, and um, more inflammatory mediators. So it can continue to grow. Now, the real, so this can continue to grow and encroach into the vessel. So, you know, over the years, it's going to get bigger and bigger, and eventually it's, it's going to completely occlude the vessel, or include the vessel enough at least so the patient starts to have symptoms. What kind of symptoms might they have? Well, it depends on where the vein is, or where the artery is, I'm sorry. Um, it, you know, if, if it's peripheral, or va peripheral vascular disease, and this process is occurring in the femoral artery, for instance, and you know, this can happen in any artery in the body, then the patient might start to have claudication. That is, pain in the lower extremities with activity because when you're you know you're using your muscles and you're not able to supply the extra blood flow because the wall of the artery has been occluded so much then you're going to have ischemia with activity right so that's peripheral vascular disease you could have coronary artery disease and then if the heart, just the same process as peripheral vascular disease, if the coronary arteries are, you know, 80% occluded with, an ath with a stable atheroma, um, you're not going to have symptoms at rest necessarily, but when you, you know, go out and walk up two flights of steps and your heart is, is crying for more oxygen because, because it's pumping harder and faster, then you are going to have um, chest pain with activity otherwise known as stable angina. And if you have the process going on with, in, with the vessel supplying your brain, 
then you may end up with a TIA. So you get the picture. So in all of these cases, you've got a stable plaque that is gradually encroaching on the vessel. And the body actually can usually compensate by, by um, growing collateral vessels over time. So this is a stable situation. And it's not life-threatening, no matter what organ is involved. The problem is, when we get to the fourth phase, and here, let me erase some of this here. The fourth phase is called an unstable plaque. And what happens is we have this huge inflammatory stew down here. This is all inflamed. We've got cytokines, we've got um, we've got macrophages, we've got neutrophils, and you know it's all contained and it's growing, yes, and it's slowly encroaching on the vessel, yes. But the big problem is if something damages the plaque and this plaque opens up because of maybe hypertension, more smoking, um, chemicals that, uh, that break down the endothelium, whatever. This um, fibrous plaque breaks and this big inflammatory stew is suddenly um, open to all those all the inflammatory proteins that are part of the bloodstream that are always inactivated and they all of a sudden become activated we activate coagulation factors we activate um, platelets and we end up with this big clot starting to form and the problem is this big nasty plot, clot that's forming can easily break off and float down into a smaller vessel. So this is called an unstable plaque. And this is the most dangerous situation. It's when the fibrous cap breaks, fibrous plaque rupture, releases the inflammatory mediators um, or the inflammatory mediators are, are are in contact with the proteins in the blood that um, that are usually inactive that control coagulation and inflammation and we end up with um, with a uh, a big clot that forms that can quickly embolize so this is what causes unstable situations so we end up with unstable angina We end up with acute, other acute coronary syndromes, like an MI. We end up with a stroke. We end up with peripheral vascular emboli, so arterial, peripheral arterial emboli, and you know you'll end up with an ischemic limb, things like that. Okay, this brings me to the end of my discussion of atherosclerosis. Now, um, please uh, feel free to ask me questions in the comments, and um, please also uh, leave some feedback for me in, in the way of a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And you're always welcome to, um, to just simply visit my uh, pathophysiology channel. The link is available here um, if you want quick access to my other videos. And thank you very much for watching.